Dutch neo-Calvinism, as pioneered by Kuiper, contests, so this is what is it all about, contests that the dominating principle of Calvinism is not soteriological justification by faith, but in the widest sense, cosmological. The dominating principle being the sovereignty of the triune God over the whole cosmos in all its spheres and kingdoms, visible and invisible. Hey guys, Joe here, back to the word today with a fun video, Bavink and Neo-Calvinism. What is Neo-Calvinism? We're gonna be going over some stuff, sharing it with all of you. This is a part of a series of videos I'm doing on Herman Bavink, his reformed dogmatics and his theology, Neo-Calvinism. Wanted to share with all of you what I've been learning. Uh, in this video, which the content is all timestamped below, so feel free to jump ahead to the section that most interests you. I'm going to cover a man in tension caught between two worlds. So how Herman Bavink became a premier theologian of Dutch neo-Calvinism along with Abraham Kuyper. I'm going to cover in two different ways Christians relate to culture. Uh, notes most notably from a TGC article by uh, Sutato and Brock. Um, we're going to cover in that section that I've pulled mainly from that article, Neo-Calvinism, a short summary, three Neo-Calvinist instincts, and what is Neo-Calvinism, 16 theses. And then I'm going to end with a Tim Keller quote. So that's the content for this video. This is Back to the Word. My channel exists to equip and encourage you to read the Bible, good books, and have conversations that truly matter. If you're along for that journey, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss a new video and so others see this video recommended to them. So with that, let's go ahead and get into just this video content. This video is a part of a series and different videos I've done after I recently bought Bovink's Reformed Dogmatics, which sent me into some questions about why should I read this? Why do other people recommend it and read it? Um, I did a video on that. I did a video on who is Herman Bovink, his theology, his notable works, and in this video, Bavink and Neo-Calvinism, specifically diving into this relationship between Orthodox Christianity, the Reformed faith, and being a modern person living in the modern world and modernity. And so we're going to be looking at Neo-Calvinism specifically in this video. Just laying out there, anytime I talk about a certain theological discipline, just want you to know my background. I'm a staff member at a Southern Baptist church. Um, not necessarily reformed in the confessional sense, but definitely Calvinistic leaning in my soteriology. I've done a video on my channel, Are You Reformed? Cue the card in the top. I'll also link it in the description below if you want to know more about where I stand on things and what the different categories are. And so let's go ahead and get into the content for this specific video right now. So first up, content for this video. My notes will be going along the side. Feel free to pause as I kind of read some of them and summarize some of them as well if you want to read more in depth. Anything that I mention will be linked below in the description for this video. So, a man in tension caught between two worlds, how Herman Bavink became a premier theologian of Dutch neo-Calvinism. Uh, also, uh, premier theologian would be Abraham Kuiper. So these are notes that I took from John Bolt's introduction at the beginning of the Reformed Dogmatics by Baker Academic. And so we're hopping into this section that talks about Bavink's theological education and schooling. So Bavink spent one year studying at Campen Theological Seminary. That was the seminary tied to the denomination that his dad was a part of, that 20 or so years, even before Bavink's birth, had succeeded from the Dutch Reformed um, national church for the Netherlands. So he spent one year of training there and before sharing his desire and then moving his study to the University of Leiden, a school for it, known for its aggressive modernist and scientific approach to theology. He did change schools and his desire was to be acquainted with the modern theology firsthand. Even though they didn't weren't part of his denomination, he wanted to be exposed to those modern ideas in the classroom. He completed his doctoral work from Leiden in 1880. 
Um, this Leiden experience, having this front row seat to modernity and this time of enlightenment and liberal theology moving into the church in different respects and all these advancements in psychology and science um, really gave rise to, in Bavinck's life, a tension uh, between, one, his commitment to orthodox theology and spirituality, and two, his desire to understand and appreciate what he could about the modern world, its worldview, and culture. He really was a man between two worlds, trying to find the synthesis, as we would say, between Christ and culture is something we might say in our day. This Christianity being orthodox, confessional, reformed, but then also being a modern person exposed to all this modern modernity and modern ideas. And all the while, as this was going on, he was being justly critical of both extremes that he saw in his day. So what were those extremes? They're right there on the screen for you. The Christian who desires most of all to contemplate God and as a result severs all ties with the world. There were those in the Netherlands who tried to get out. And we even have churches in the United States because they moved to places around the Great Lakes like Michigan and Chicago and Indiana and Illinois. And there's those who got out and just left. And then the other extreme he saw is there were Christians who tried to issue in the kingdom of God with moral good that de degenerated slowly into unfeeling moralism, becoming more like the world, and they would just lose their spirituality altogether. And so he was trying to avoid both of those extremes. And he said, how do we synthesize in this moment confessional Christianity, but also what's going on in our world right now? Now, how do I be reformed with the theology of John Calvin in Geneva and the reformers right now where I am without going to either one of these extremes? Thus, Bavinck sought a Trinitarian synthesis of Christianity and culture, a Christian worldview that incorporated what was best and true in both pietism and modernism. So thinking about those things, both Piety, living the way of Jesus, spirituality, walking with him, but then also being exposed to being a real a modern person. While above all, honoring the theological and confessional richness of the Reformed tradition dating all the way back to Calvin. And that's from Reformed Dogmatics, Volume 1, page 15. The vehicle Calvin found for this is the topic for this video was Dutch Neo-Calvinism. And along with its visionary pioneer, Abraham Kuyper, Bavink became one of its most respected spokespersons and premier theologians. So there's a short overview of how he got there and what he was looking for. Continues here. It says, Dutch Neo-Calvinism, as pioneered by Kuyper, contests, so this is what is it all about, contests that the dominating principle of Calvinism is not soteriological justification by faith, but in the widest sense, cosmological. The dominating principle being the sovereignty of the triune God over the whole cosmos in all its spheres and kingdoms, visible and invisible. What a quote right there. Break it down. Don't have time to do all of it. But really what it's getting after is that the doctrines of grace... Uh, Calvinism as a soteriological system to show how people get saved and God saving sinners uh, by his grace um, looks behind that and says God is sovereign over all things. It's often said that behind the five points of Calvinism is really one point that God is sovereign over everything. And so neo-Calvinism is pointing a light on that exact thing even when it comes to our interactions with culture and the world. And so the dominating principle is the sovereignty of the triune God over the whole of creation, all of its spheres and kingdoms, visible and invisible. Really just a statement there. All truth is God's truth and all of it leads back to him when properly applied. Um, for Abraham Kuyper, this fundamental principle of divine sovereignty led to four derivatory or, and related doctrines or principles. So getting away from um, Bavink here for a little bit, but exploring uh, when he embraced this, what Abraham Kuyper, who was the premier first one to talk about this and come up with this, 
uh, came down with. So these four derivatives and related to doctrines and principles is one, the doctrine of common grace is the conviction that apart from divine grace, there is a common grace that in some ways restrains and affects uh, the effects of sins and bestows general gifts on all people. This is something we see talked about a lot in neo-Calvinism, this concept of common grace towards all people and how God relates to all people. Uh, also sphere sovereignty, the various spheres of human activity. So we're talking about family, education, business, science, art, etc. derive their most important purpose, according to neo-Calvinists, uh, not from the redemption or the church, but from the law of God, the creator. And so thus they are autonomous, even from the state and are directly responsible to God. They don't tie things in the way as I understand this. And I might get some of these things wrong. I'm just trying to tell you what I've learned and help me in the comments if I'm misunderstanding things. But God has sphere sovereignty over everything and every sphere of life is responsible to him is what they're getting after there. Also, a distinction between the church as institute and the church as organism is something that's talked a lot about by neo-Calvinists. The church as institute or institution is the church gathered around the world, uh, gathered around the word of God, sorry, the word of God and the sacraments. The church as organism is the church diversely spread out in the visible vocations of life. So the way of talking about the church as an institution and as an organism is used the, these words in these terms and ways in neo-Calvinism. And finally, the spiritual antithesis. The regenerating wor or work of the Holy Spirit breaks humanity in two and creates two kinds of consciousness. This is really important for neo-Calvinists. Um, and according to Kuiper, that of the regenerate and the unregenerate. So there's two kinds of people. So these two cannot be identical, and these two kinds of people will develop two kinds of science. So therefore, it says, a conflict in the scientific enterprise between both kinds of people is not a conflict between science and faith, but between two scientific systems, each having its own faith. Uh, we'll get more into this here in a little bit, but as I understand this, um, is really that the Holy Spirit and his regenerative work really makes Christians and non-Christians are divided in half. And so when both go after an endeavor like science, um, they're going to go about science in a different way. The Christian in a certain way with um, presuppositions that are different from the person who is a non-Christian, who is an unbeliever, who is unregenerate. And he's saying when we have a conflict between the science of those two individuals, it's not pitting faith, Christianity, versus science. It's really two advanced, two sciences that are going against each other and have faith in different presuppositions or rooted truths, as I understand it. It says, with neo-Calvinism bringing some unity to his thought, that being of the thought of Bavink, uh, is the fundamental theme that shapes Bavink. Is this the fundamental theme that shapes Bavink's theo theology? The fundamental theme that shapes Bavink's entire theology is the Trinitarian idea that grace restores nature. So that's Reformed Dogmatics, Volume 1, page 18. It says, Christianity does not introduce a single foreign element into the creation, according to Bavink. Rather, it restores what was corrupted by sin. So grace restores nature is a theme throughout Neo-Calvinism you will hear used again and again and again. All right, moving on. I want to take a time out from Bavink and Neo-Calvinism to just briefly cover in this video two different ways Christians relate to culture because it's really important. And so we just saw that Bavink was struggling. How do I synthesize being a Christian in the modern world and the modern culture? And so here are the categories and ways Christians have thought about this for a long time. So first, the cultural definition. This is pulled from Richard Neuber's work, Christ and Culture. It is, uh, you should know about it, his different categories. Um, very important to Christian life, thought, and advancements. But he defines culture as the secondary environment which man superimposes on the natural. Very important there. Superimposes on what is naturally there, on the natural. It compromises language, habits, ideas, beliefs, customs, social organizations, inherited artifacts, technical procedures, and values. So that's how we're defining culture as we talk about it as Christians, or how Richard Niebuhr talks about it. 
Now, moving along with that definition of culture, how have Christians related to culture? There's two camps, two extremes. So the first phrase is, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? And the second one is plundering or despoiling the Egyptians. And both of them talk about Christians' relationship or theology or Christianity's relationship to culture. So briefly explaining them here. What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? This phrase first comes from Territilium. And the idea here is, what does Athens, the seat and center point for philosophy, um, have to do with Jerusalem, the center of theology slash religion and their relationship to one another? And so Territilium originally brought this up as a patristic uh, age Christian father, um, he posed this question as a statement. And so what was he making a statement about? So he was conf- concerned that Christians not become so enamored with Greek philosophy that they scorn the simplicity of the Hebrew scriptures and gospel texts to argue about them on the basis of pagan philosophers' terminology. He was worried that we would incorporate so much of the modern culture and world into Christianity that it would become more attractive than the gospel itself. Um, This phrase, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem, is also pretty popular and used pretty early because of Paul's interactions in Athens in Acts 17, 16 through 34, that you can go read in the Bible and see how Paul shows that even what the Athenians were dealing with, um, what like how that relates to the gospel but how it breaks down and and he presents the gospel in that context but what hath athens to do with jerusalem they should stay separate and not come together uh the second phrase that people use around christianity and culture on the other extreme so what hath athens to do with jerusalem they should totally be separate to plundering or despoiling the Egyptians. This comes from Irenaeus of Lyons, and this is the idea that the church is to penetrate culture. Christians are to penetrate culture, take its best resources, melt them down, redefine them, and utilize them for the benefit of church and the glory of God. That we can use the best the culture comes up with because all truth is God's truth, belongs to him, and use it for the gospel and to glorify God. And so he was the first to use this illustration, um, and it's based on Exodus 12, 35 through 36. And so he talks about in his illustration, the Israelites symbolize the church, and the gold, silver, and clothes of the Egyptians represent the culture. And so we're despoiling or plundering the Egyptians for the best parts of their culture and truth. Um, This concept, concept is applied to everything. So that's just we're talking about from science to literature, theater, art, and even holidays. For if the perspective is for if God gave the knowledge and thought to all people, Christians are then able to take them and use them because ultimately the truth that they speak to traces itself back to God. Um, Just a little bit more on the development of this. Plundering the Egyptians is a concept that was first formulated by Irenaeus of Lyons. I already talked about that. He used it to refute the Marcionites. Um, who said that God commanded um, the Israel to do wrong in spoiling the Egyptians. And so he talks about spoiling them and uh, um, plundering them was not wrong for Israel to do. Then it later was promoted by Origen of Alexandria in the context of science and education. It was then further polished by St. Gregory of Nazianzen to defend the Christian practice of Easter and Christmas. And then it finally found its solidified form by St. Augustine of Hippo, who took the work of all three and applied it to all pagan literature, science, theater, logic, philosophy, and rhetoric. So there's the development of those two camps that we still have conversations about today. What hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? Theology, philosophy, theology, and these cultural disciplines should stay separate. And then plundering of the Egyptians, we should take the best they have to offer and use it to glorify God because all of the truth they're coming up with, as much as it is truth and it applies that God comes from him, belongs to him and to us. So those are two ways of doing that. So just those relationships there. I'm just saying neo-Calvinism in a certain way is trying to do the middle road. It's trying to stay away from both of those extremes. It's trying to stay in the middle. How do we function in the middle 
but probably actually moving more towards the culturist side of things, of plundering the Egyptians. Uh, next segment of the video, notes from the TGC article, the Gospel Coalition article by Gray Sutento, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that wrong, and Corey Brock. So this is a helpful article. They wrote part of the Keller uh, Center for Cultural Apologetics tied to the Gospel Coalition. And they've done this kind of as a summary out of their Lexham Press book that came out in 2022 on Neo-Calvinism, a Theological Introduction. So I will reference and point you to their book if you want to know more, but I just pulled highlights from this article together to share with you what Neo-Calvinism is all about. I hope to get that book in the future and will definitely do a review on this channel when I do so in the future. But first, Neo-Calvinism short summary. I think before we get into the bare bones and look at the three Cal Neo-Calvinist instincts and the 16 theses of kind of what Neo-Calvinism is all about, a short summary is that Neo-Calvinism was first developed by Abraham Kuyper it, and it's a flavor of Calvinism. It's not to be confused with New Calvinism, N-E-W, um, kind of this like young, restless reform, the new wave of Calvinism that's come specifically in the West, nor is it to be confused with um, hyper-Calvinism. We're talking about Neo, N-E-O, Calvinism. So it's a flavor of Calvinism that emphasizes the sovereignty of God over every area of life and desires to understand what it means to be a reform or Reformation Protestant under the tutelage of the reformer of Geneva, so John Calvin, but in a different cultural landscape than Calvin ever knew. And so that's what we're talking about in the main kind of short summary of what neo-Calvinism is. Moving on, they have in their article this kind of statement that's going to set up these three neo-Calvinist instincts and then 16 theses that I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this video. So due to the conflicting uh, explanations of neo-Calvinism and even the way the term is used, they say it's usually thrown around as kind of a slang term sometimes as like a bash, like your theology is too close to culture or your theology um, moves the other direction. It still gets used and thrown around as kind of a slang word or a slap against people who move one way or the other too much. He says, we might be led to ask, as we think about the explanation of what neo-Calvinism is, who is a neo-Calvinist? Like, who steps forward as a premier neo-Calvinist? He says, but a better question might be, they talk about in their article, how does the theology of the reformer of Geneva matter for today? That's what neo-Calvinism is going after in a certain cultural sense. The latter question frames the issue so the Reformed Christian community can, uh, can all, to a degree, subscribe and think about how do we apply the Reformed faith to today. And to answer this question, we should explore, they talk about three neo-Calvinist instincts and 16 summarizing theses to help us understand the impulse of the original movement and to serve as a guide for how we use the term and implement neo-Calvinism today. So first up, three neo-Calvinist instincts. As we go through this, I'm going to read it, explain as much as I understand. I might not be perfect, so I would reference their book if you want more information on these things. So first up, neo-Calvinism is ancient yet modern. Kuiper and Bavink, its two premier theologians, worked hard to convey how orthodoxy and modernity exist in a reciprocal relationship. So they talk about the two extremes. If you emphasize orthodoxy at the cost of that which is modern, that you live in the world today, it will lead to a conservatism that forgets our work as theologian depends on the very conditions that enable us to be here in the first place. This is the idea that systematic theology, as we call it today, responds to questions that our culture, that people today have about God, his work, his ways, and so if we forget where we live and we just do in theology, how does it profit anyone is kind of what that phrase is getting after. On the other hand, an overemphasis on the modern world at the expense of our confessional, scriptural, and ancient moorings forgets that our modern age continues to be indebted to the theological and ethical culture it rejects. If we just embrace the modern and throw off that which is old and that which comes behind, uh, we forget our indebtedness to that. We forget our roots. We lose, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. We throw out that which is true to embrace what? 
just what we perceive as true now is kind of what that's getting after. So neo-Calvinism is against both extremes. Neo-Calvinism rests on revelation. So this is a key thing for Bob Inc. and his writing. He is eminently, deeply scriptural, biblical in his writing. God's revelation is the secret to understanding our lives, our lives now, our lives in the future, our lives 100 years, 1500 years ago. God's revelation is the secret to understanding our lives today. It says, theologians must understand that philo philosophies around us not resting on the revelation of God will produce false binaries. So that's false categories. We pit this against this. It says, scripture is not our base. We'll come up with the wrong categories. And reductionisms will come up with the wrong reductionisms. We'll reduce things to its essence and we'll reduce it wrongly because we don't base it on God's categories for the world he created. Moving on, neo-Calvinism is committed to Catholicity. This is the third instinct of neo-Calvinism. Neo-Calvinism's theological commitments highlight the true universality of the Christian faith. So Christianity is a pearl. It's the gospel for all places and all times, all cultures, all peoples. And so Christianity is also a leavening power. It can take root in and influence all places and times and in a diversity of ways. So thus neo-Calvinism makes a firm distinction then between the philosophies and cultures, cultures Christianity became providentially tethered to in the past and Christianity itself. Christianity's form may look different in each time and place, but the substance and revelation remain the same. So this is saying that neo-Calvinism, a key part of this is to look back on, say, like the time of the reformers and say, well, that's the form Christianity took in the time of the reformers. Or even looking back at Rome, this is the, the form Christianity took in the time of Rome. But what's true of Christianity across all time, across all peoples, and its broad spectrum that is the true heart of Christianity, not just in its cultural contextualization. So neo-Calvinism is acutely attuned to those differences. Moving into next segment, what is neo-Calvinism? 16 theses. Here's what um, Sutanto and Brock say in their article. They said, below our 16 theses, we believe provide a healthy understanding of the core of neo-Calvinist theology. If these are compelling, you can find expansion, explanation, and application in fuller form in our book. And so I'll go through these. I'm going to read them. I'm going to um, kind of just chat briefly, debrief a couple of them. But if you want more details about these, I hope that I don't get these wrong. I'm going to explain them to the best of my ability. But if you know what they truly mean and want more, check out their book that they recommended right there. I'll link it in the description of this video. I hope to get their book in the near future and read it as well. So these are the theses, kind of the 16 theses of neo-Calvinism and what it's all about. First, neo-Calvinism is a critical reception of reformed orthodoxy contextualized to address the questions of modernity. Number two, Christianity can challenge, subvert, and fulfill the cultures and philosophical systems of every age. I think that's an important one for me to think about. How does Christianity move into a culture, expose that culture, culture's beliefs about uh, redemption, about peace, about security, about eschatology, the end times, and show that it falls on its face and then shows Christianity as a better way, in a certain way, and that it fulfills their longings in ways that they could not have even imagined. So that's just something that interests me a lot. Neo-Calvinism rejects theological conservatism. That would be a negative conservatism. Um, and progressivism. So that's the contrast we already talked about earlier in the video, this total retreat from not being engaged with the modern world and living in the modern world and its questions at all, but then also the opposite, being so engrossed in the modern world that you leave Christianity and throw it all behind as not worth following at all and throw out what is true um, in different ways because of your progressivism. Instead, it applies historic creedal and confessional theology to the concerns of the contemporary world. So it's bringing the two together, that relationship between the two again. 
Uh, number four, the triune God created the world and all creatures as a living unity and diversity with a definite purpose and goal. Number five, organism and organic unity are fitting terms to describe creation's many uh, unities and diversities as it analogically uh, reflects the triune God. Number six, the image of God is the pinnacle of creation's organic shape, referring to humanity collectively, male and female, and the self as a unity. Number seven, the problem with the world is not ontological, but ethical. So ontological dealing with being, ethical dealing with action. Uh, sin has corrupted much, in fact, everything. Um, so that's a key focus for them in neo-Calvinism. Number eight, out of the sinful mass of the organism of humanity under Adam, God elects to regenerate individuals into a new sanctified organic humanity under Christ, thus asserting a covenantal antithesis. We've already talked about antithesis in this video, the two different groups of people, the one the Holy Spirit regenerates and then the unregenerate. But this covenantal antithesis between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, pulling on some covenantal theology type of things right there. Number nine, by the Spirit work, the Spirit's work in common grace, God restrains sin and gifts fallen humanity with moral epistemic and life-giving goods to enjoy for the sake of redemption in Christ. So this is common grace for all people talked about in Neo-Calvinism. God has revealed himself to every person, both objectively and subjectively. This implanted affection and knowledge of God isn't a human determination as the product of reason or natural theology, but God's general revelation by the Holy Spirit. So speaking specifically about how God discloses himself and general revelation there. Number 11, the Bible is God's revelation of himself. As the Spirit inspires a diversity of human authors to write all that God intends to communicate, the Bible serves as the ultimate norm and agent of unity, though not the sole source for the fields of knowledge. I would have to dig more into this to see exactly what it's saying, but there's something key about knowledge and fields of knowledge regarding neo-Calvinism and also God's revelation of himself being the scriptures. The triune God and his revelation matter for the entire human life because every person always stands before the face of God. 13, wisdom points us to a Christian worldview. Christian theology should discipline the insights of both philosophy and the various sciences. Christians should conform their entire selves to the lordship of Christ. This is really that neo-Calvinist statement. Think uh, the Abraham Kuyper famous quote, uh, there is not one square inch across this whole world where Christ does not declare mind. This is saying that the Christian worldview um, should discipline the insights of every discipline, philosophy, as well as the various sciences, and that Christians should always submit to the lordship of Christ in all they do. This isn't a division of, of secular and sacred. Everything you do because it's under God's sovereignty is sacred in a certain way, is what they're kind of getting after here. And I would have to flesh that out a little bit differently more, but that's where I get from some of these thoughts that go through my head as I read the statement of what neo-Calvinists are trying to say there. Number 14, recreation happens by divine agency alone and brings creation to its original goal that God would make his dwelling place with humankind in the consummated and sanctified cosmos. So we're saying God is behind divine agency brings the creation to its original goal right there. Number 15, Jesus Christ's messianic dominion as king of God's kingdom is the aim of God's work in history and the purpose of creaturely redemption. So there's some comments there about why God's redeeming people for himself. Uh, so Jesus can become king of God's creation. And then number 16, the visible church exists as an institute and an organism as an institute to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments and as an organism of individuals bound together by the spirit to witness new creation. We already talked about this once in this video, a little bit higher up with Abraham Kuyper, but here we see it again, this neo-Calvinist kind of focus on the institute being the church gathered to hear the word around the sacraments, but then also as an organism 
out in the world, living the Christian life, um, witnessing to the new creation. Moving on, the article continues to talk about these theses are helpful to address pressing questions like the following. So briefly, here are three of these questions. It says, how might we continue to transmit and translate the older theologies of the past into the contemporary philosophical idioms of the day? How might we continue to accommodate the genuine findings of contemporary scientific scholarship without compromising the substance of our theological commitments? And then how do we not merely tell, but show that the Christian faith continues to be relevant for our age and for every age? So these are questions that we have even right now in doing theology and in our contemporary world. And so these 16 theses by the neo-Calvinists would kind of be guiding lights and helps to answering these questions from their specific theological persuasion and perspective. So with that, most of the content for this video is over. I want to finish with a quote by Tim Keller, who was influenced massively by, from his through his theology professor at one of the schools that he went to and reading Louis Burkhoff, whose systematic theology was written mostly based on Herman Bovig's theology and reform dogmatics as uh, and it really influenced Keller in his cultural apologetic and how he presented Christianity to, um, to people and how he did evangelism. Even the article I pulled most of this content from is for uh, the Gospel Coalition's, the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. And so we see even neo-Calvinism themes in Keller's ministry, like grace restoring nature and various other things that he applied uh, in his own context where he was doing ministry. But here's this Tim Keller, Keller quote that I think is really kind of helpful to summarize the importance of neo-Calvinism, or at least our Christianity um, relationship with culture and how we share Christianity in our world today to be a little bit helpful. So Tim Keller here says, when many Christians enter a vocational field, either they seal off their faith and go to work like everyone else around them, or they spout Bible verses to their co-workers. We do not know very well how to persuade people of Christianity's answers by showing them the faith-based worldview roots of everyone's work. He says, we do not know how to equip our people to think out the implications of the gospel for art, business, government, journalism, entertainment, and scholarship. And so Keller found in neo-Calvinism a good way to counteract both of those things, um, to equip people to see gospel impl implications in their lives, but also to persuade uh, those who are unconverted, those who are not Christian, of the, the of Christianity and its validity to all of life. So with that, the video is over. If you made it to the end of this video, which I know it was a bit of a long one, I would love to know that in the um, comments below. So comment, I made it through the video, and then I'd love to hear from you. What is one thing you learned uh, from my video that stood out to you? Or what did I miss? If you were going through and I missed something or I miss, I, I was not able to explain something properly, I'd love to learn with all of you. I don't share this as someone who ha owns the market on truth and has everything right. This is something I wanted to study and then helpful in me, my study, I wanted to share it with all of you. And so I hope that it's been helpful and encouraging. Check out some of my other videos on Bob Inc. I have linked the playlist in the description for this video so you can see all of those as I read Reform Dogmatics and talk about who he is and other things. Those videos will go in there and so you can check out those if you wanna know more about him and his theology and other things. And with that, so this is Back to the Word. I would remind you as we finish the video, if you haven't already, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss a video if you like content like this and so that you help others see this type of content. And next, until next time, continue to read, treasure, follow the word. God bless, and I'll see you guys soon.